Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. I'm the Reverend Jennifer Innes, and I serve as the minister with this congregation. The members, friends, children, and youth strive to fulfill our mission, our vision, and live in covenant. Creating a liberal religious community is a special effort for the sake of doing our part to help heal the world. Welcome to this gathering. It is so good to be together. For this year, we are exploring the themes and resources from Soul Matters, a Unitarian Universalist source of worship information, small group study, and programs for children and youth. Last month, we focused on renewal. For this month, we, our theme is deep listening. And as part of our listening, let us include paying attention to the earth, as the seasons change and the cycles of life keep turning. We honor the Peoria nation who lived through so many cycles in their time. If you are new to the congregation, I invite you to help us get to know you. At the end of this service, there will be a link for our Zoom coffee hour, and all are invited to the conversation. Please send a note to the church office if you'd like more information about the congregation. For the special announcement today, I call your attention to the renewal of our covenant circles. These small groups meet at various times over the course of months, uh, different times and dates. Every September is a chance to renew these circles and to get to know a small group of members and friends in the congregation. This is a great way to get connected to this community. We have been sharing video messages from participants in these covenant circles, and for this week, we hear from Galen Fadley. Hello, I'm Galen Fadley, and I'd like to spend a minute talking with you about Covenant Circles. I especially want to talk about Covenant Circles during the pandemic. But let's start off with the basics. If you're not familiar, a Covenant Circle is a group of up to 12 people that meets twice a month to talk about a topic. Covenant Circles are structured in such a way to encourage deep listening and to provide a safe place for members to share. All the information in a covenant circle remains confidential within the group. While we are not a huge church, we are definitely bigger than is feasible to know every single member. Personally, I have found a covenant circle a great way to get to know a few of my fellow congregants. Since I first joined a covenant circle, it has played an important part of my spiritual journey. This year, I have found that its importance has grown. When the pandemic first struck, we switched to virtual meetings. Sure, we had a few hiccups along the way, but something amazing also happened. Our attendance has been near perfect. We met throughout the summer when we would normally have taken a break, and generally, our members are expressing a greater appreciation in the group. Sure, part of this might just be the fact that we're traveling less, but I think there's something deeper. For many, in this era of social distancing, connections with other people are few and far between. The deep connections between the members of a covenant circle are that much more powerful in contrast to our ever-shrinking social interactions. Furthermore, 2020 has been a tumultuous year in many other ways, and discussing what has been going on in the wide world has helped me process it. I encourage you to consider joining a covenant circle. I think you will find participation to be fulfilling, and I know that you'll get to make new connections and meet new friends. Thank you, Galen. You're welcome to contact Joyce Rosenberger. You may also drop a line to the office if you'd like to know more about our Covenant Circles and to get signed up. We hope you will be part of these wonderful small groups and enhance your experience of being part of this congregation. I have two additional notes of thanks for today. First, thank you to Judith Corin Shanahan for addressing our pulpit area. The worship team is returning to the practice of having members sign up for a month and adding some color and texture to our pulpit space. Nancy Taylor is the keeper of the sign up sheet and I am available for answering any questions about themes and what might work with the camera. Thank you very much, Judith. Austin and I went wow when we entered the sanctuary. And I want to offer a note of thanks for the music we get to enjoy today. It is courtesy of the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Palouse in Moscow, Idaho, music artist Leah Morris, and the Community Unitarian Universalist Church of New York. We are so grateful to be able to share this music and to offer it in worship together. And now, 
let us enter into worship. The Chalice Lighting by Reverend Leslie Takahashi. All that we have ever loved and all that we have ever been stands with us on the brink of all that we aspire to create. A deeper peace, a larger love, a more embracing hope, and a deeper joy in this life we share. We light this chalice in the spirit of love and hope. Today's opening words are by John Saxon. Listen, can you hear it? The Spirit is calling. It calls us in the silence and through the noise and busyness of our daily lives. It calls us in the brightness of the day and the darkness of the night, in times of hope and despair. Listen, can you hear it? The Spirit is calling. It doesn't matter what you call it, for it has no name and has many different names. The Spirit of Life the spirit of love, the spirit of compassion, the spirit of hope, the spirit of justice. Listen, can you hear it? The spirit is calling. It's calling to you and to me. It's calling us to greater wholeness, greater connection, greater service, greater love. It's calling us to heal the brokenness within ourselves, in others, and in the world. It's calling us to live more deeply, it's calling us to beauty. It's calling us to laugh and dance and sing. It's calling us to live through life's pain and sorrow. It's calling us to live courageously and kindly, to speak our truth in love, and to bend the moral arc of the universe toward justice. It's calling us into community. It's calling us into the greater life of all. Listen, can you hear it? The Spirit is calling. Good morning. Today, since we're talking about promises, I'm going to make you a promise. I promise you're going to like today's story. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Partners by Mark Gilman. Before there was anything, there was the mystery that some people call God, a few angels, 
and a huge swirling glob of rocks and water with no place to go. The angels ask God, why don't you clean up this mess? So God collected rocks from the huge swirling glob and put them together in clumps and said, some of these clumps of rocks will be planets and some will be stars and some will be just rocks. Then God collected water from the huge swirling glob and put it together in pools and said, some of these pools of water will be oceans and some will become clouds and some of this water will be just water. Then the angel said, well, God, it's neater now, but is it finished? And God answered, nope. On some of the rocks, God placed growing things and creeping things and things that God only knows what they are. And when God had done all of this, the angels asked God, is the world finished now? And God answered, nope. God made two humans from some of the water and dust and said to them, I'm tired now. Please finish up the world for me. Really, it's almost done. But the two humans said, we can't finish the world alone. You have the plans and we're too little. You're big enough, God answered them. But I agree to this. If you keep trying to finish the world, I will be your partner. The two humans ask, what's a partner? And God answered, a partner is someone you work on on a big thing that neither of you can do alone. If you have a partner, it means that you can never give up because your partner is depending on you. On the days you think I'm not doing enough and on the days you think I'm not doing enough, even on those days, we are still partners and we must not stop trying to finish the world. That's the deal. And they all agreed to that deal. Then, when the angels asked God, is the world finished yet? God answered, I don't know. Go ask my partners. And so, just like God and the two humans, may we all be partners as we work together to finish the world with the goal of beloved community. So be it. We meet in the spaces between us, in stillness, music, heard or unheard. The apparent void teeming with the you and the I that overlap in the one sacred living moment we share. We meet in the spaces between us. And so we meet to share the joys and sorrows, names and milestones among us, Shariki gathered our joys and sorrows for this week. We offer our healing wishes to Nancy Phillips as she receives rehab at Apostolic Christian Restmore in Morton, Illinois. In our larger world, I offer wishes for wisdom and compassion for our public leaders as they personally encounter the impact of COVID-19 this week. May the president and his family recover May former Vice President Biden and his family stay healthy. The suffering is great for all of us as we endure and the death toll rises. May we keep before us the practice of loving kindness and compassion for all. Knowing that there are many more joys and sorrows among us, I offer an invitation. I invite you to reach out by any means available. Be in touch with a neighbor, a friend, a member of your family this week. Find someone you've been meaning to talk with for a while, but haven't gotten around to it. Maybe this week is the time. Find them and ask, how is it with your soul? One of my colleagues in ministry reminded me of the value of contact. If you have thought of somebody, check on them even just to say hello. There's a phrase that has been emerging this week from more than one source and more than one person in my life. 
And that phrase is, my soul hurts. My soul hurts. I hear this from people who may or may not subscribe to a particular belief or definition of soul, but somehow something deep inside is in distress, is suffering, is in pain. Perhaps some small connection can ease our weary hearts and tired spirits. I invite you to call, text, email, send a voicemail, write a card, and ask, how is it with your soul? Practice presence with each other. Pay attention to what happens to that person and to yourself when you talk to them and when you encounter them. Let us take one more moment for all the joys and sorrows, names and milestones that are among us and within us. Let us take one more moment and hold them all together in the embrace of this community. Let us take one more moment in silence. Amen. A Prayer for the Listeners by the Rev. Joe M. Cherry, edited by Dave Grebner. When my ears are full of the worries, the concerns, the pains of others, grant me permission for silence. When my arms and shoulders and back ache from the burdens of others, grant me permission to set them down. Guide me to another, a friend perhaps, to talk with, and not for once to be talked at. And may I not be a burden to them as I pour out my pain, my weariness, my exhaustion, but a place, a space of mutual care. And my listener friend, may your arms know no matter how tired I am, you can turn to me too. My spouse, the Reverend Patrick Price, put a couple of thoughts together about the nature of covenant. And he talks about drawing from a few of our colleagues. George Kim Beach says that the word covenant signifies a framework within which intentionality takes effect. The Reverend Robert Latham defines a religious covenant as a compact among a group of people, which states their mission and how that mission will be transformed by their life stewardship. Now, this is not the same thing, this idea of covenant, as stating a belief or a purpose. A belief or a purpose may not entail any pledge or commitment to fulfill or carry them out. A covenant, on the other hand, is explicit in its intention to fulfill its purpose. Latham writes, while purpose calls for an empowerment of vision, covenant empowers its vision with commitment. Let me say again. While purpose calls for an empowerment of its vision, covenant empowers its vision with commitment. Ministry is covenant in action, Latham says. It is covenant stewardship. And the only appropriate gauge for measuring the effectiveness of ministry is the covenant it seeks to embody. Covenants ask and answer two basic questions. Why have we come together? And how are we to be together? What are our purposes in making a free and mutual agreement? And in that light, how do we go on living with each other? Consequently, covenantal living confers identity and builds community. Covenantal living confers identity and builds community. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading is We Hold Hope Close, from
from Reverend Teresa Inez Soto. In this community, we hold hope close. We don't always know what comes next, but that cannot dissuade us. We don't always know just what to do, but that will not mean that we are lost in the wilderness. We rely on the certainty beneath, the foundation of our values and ethics. We are the people who return to love like a North Star and to the truth that we are greater together than when we are alone. Our hope does not live in some glimmer of an indistinct future. Rather, we know the way to the world of which we dream, and by covenant and the movement forward of one right action and the next, we know that one day we will arrive at home. I'm listening. I am listening, Spirit, speak to me. I'm listening, I am listening, Spirit, speak to me. My ears are wide open, my eyes are now open to see what I may be. I'm listening, I am listening, Spirit, speak to me. I'm listening, I am listening, in this moment of spirit silence. speaks to me, I can hear the voices of all my kind, I'm listening, singing, I'm licking, listening, tweeting, and howling into me. My ears are wide open, and oh, 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 the joy. My eyes are wide open, oh, 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 the love to see to what hear I for you be. and me. Oh, 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 I'm listening in this moment of silence. I am listening. I hear spirit speak through. Did you sleep well? Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a favor? Can you go and push with you for five minutes while I finish? You see I'm doing some worky stuff. For well, five seconds? Five minutes. You'll see how long. It's not very long. How many seconds is five minutes? Well, it's 300 seconds, but you don't have to count to 300. I'll just be in there to get you when I'm all done, okay? Uh, so who's going to have to count to 300? I'll do it. Okay. okay. On any given Sunday, a promise begins anew. This promise is begin between one member and another, between a minister and a member, between our children and us, between the church and the world around us in the larger circle of community. This promise is that we will cherish and promote physical, spiritual, and intellectual freedom. We will be responsible to one another for our relationships. We will never cease to explore new revelation in beliefs. This promise is that we will love the world enough to put our very lives at stake to help it be more whole. We make these promises because we seek a connection to others and to the spirit of life. We want to strengthen the access that James Luther Adams, 20th century theologian, talks about, what he calls the intimate 
and the ultimate. Those relations between one another, those lateral relationships, and between us and the larger mystery. We accomplish this task with a liberal message, recognizing that our freedom is inextricably tied to others. And the promises, our covenants, help guide us. So in many different ways in the life of this congregation, the people recognize that promises are the foundation of the community. You know, new members sign the book, uh, agreements or contracts establish relationship between a minister and the congregation. The moving up of children in the congregation is a promise made from uh, the body, the members, to the child, to the children, for lifelong support and nurture. Every year, the congregation changes a bit as we welcome new people and, with, and, and any change in relationship, that our covenants and our promises change just a little bit. These are all acts of commitment between the one and the many. And these promises and the living of them must be intentional. They cannot be automatic or simply written on a list of bullet points and check marked off of a list. There is no automatic switch or performance on demand when we're talking about how are we to live together. The start of a new ministry or the greeting of visitors is not merely the people being brought to the congregation, it's also the congregation being willing to go to the people. It's the making of a new promise within the larger one that comes every Sunday. It is no less than to say yes to what we hope will be years together in service to our beloved community and to the larger spirit of which we are a part. So we make that deal, we engage on a particular Sunday and say yes to each other. And then, and then what? So beginning tomorrow, how shall that promise be so lived? I wanna, that's what I want to talk about this morning. Not the glories of any one day or any particularly significant event or one particular Sunday, but tomorrow is the test. The next Sunday after that is the measure, the 52 and the 104 Sundays. Each are signs of how the church lives that promise between one member and another, between the minister and the members, between our children and us, between us and the world. It is the nature of the liberal religious promise to be renewed in truly every moment. We do not depend solely on what has come before. It is the nature of Unitarian Universalism to be a living tradition. And it is the nature of this liberal religion to be a tradition that keeps looking towards tomorrow. It is the nature of religion itself to help us find where we are with others and our ultimate concerns. Now, to better understand why we make such promises and talk about living in covenant, let me say a little bit more about that intimate and the ultimate. So the intimate, the lateral, and the ultimate help define two axes along which we both experience reality and help locate ourselves in the larger universe. The horizontal is that interactive plane of human experience. That horizontal is what happens between us, the good, the bad, the difficult, the mundane. And then the vertical is that intimate, subjective experience of well, the holy, some of us talk about. It is that also that dark night of the soul, as well as illumination and revelation. That vertical is where we might go in solitude in our reflection. And it is also when we feel cut off from the world and no isolation. Promises in the faith community help us maintain a closer orbit to what is our center. And the promises are guide stars to what we wish is the best manifestation of that intersection, 
that place we seek if we are to grow, to be better able to live what we cherish, and to be sustained, what though the darkness round us close. So how do we live these kinds of promises? Our very structure starts us well, and uh, I don't mean our, our history of long practice of religious critique, though we embrace that sometimes with enthusiasm and, dare I say, zest. I start further back with the promise itself that our strength very much begins in covenant. We are in relationship with member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association. We have and do and will make promises with congregations all across the country to support each other, to learn and teach together, to fight for common cause, and at times to disagree. Every congregation has its own covenant, formal or informal, spoken, uns unspoken. And there are, in fact, some covenantal aspects of this congregation that help serve as North Stars. Those include elements of the vision, of the mission, and also the covenant itself. From the Reverend Kim Beach, the word covenant, he says, signifies a framework within which intentionality takes effect. And the Reverend Robert Latham talks about religious covenant as a compact among people which states their mission and how that covenant will be transformed into reality by their life stewardship. I love that phrase, life stewardship. It is a religious covenant, a, a commitment to caretaking and caregiving and being very thoughtful and intentional about all that we have been giving, given and all that we could offer. Now, a religious covenant is not the same as stating a belief or a purpose. You don't have to make a pledge to complete either of those. But covenant, covenant requires commitment to address its purpose. Again, from Robert Latham, while covenant calls for an empowerment of its vision, covenant empowers its vision with commitment. I'll say again. Covenant empowers its vision with commitment. They ask and answer the questions of why we are together and how we will be together. People are better able to articulate both the why and the how when a congregation, when people come into a congregation that has a sense of direction, that has a sense of what its commitments are to one another and to the world. And Without a center in a known, transformative mission, Unitarian Universalists can easily become worthy of that observation that we merely believe anything we want. A non-credal faith would soon become a set of beliefs without focus, without a deeply driving desire to say how to live that mission. But when lived, covenant offers identity, builds community, and gives good markers for the intimate and the ultimate. On any given Sunday, we have a chance to live clearly and with commitment. Ministry is covenant in action, Latham says, and it's the only appropriate gauge for measuring the effectiveness of the ministry is the covenant it seeks to embody. So in this congregation's commitment to love inclusively, to welcome abundantly, and to help heal the world, and to help fight for justice in our broader community as well as amongst ourselves, these are all places where we can find our center with each other and come back to again and again. I want to offer just a short personal story about Covenant, where how did I know that I had been become part of one even when I really hadn't found that word, that word of covenant. In the adult ed program, we're talking about religious language, and this past week talked about the haunting house curriculum uh, as a way of building and nourishing faith. Well, I want to offer the haunting house curriculum uh, has children um, kind of engaged through the lens of the house, becoming at home in many ways 
uh, in the world. And in my case, uh, part of that program is building, building one's own home within the congregation through a series of refrigerator boxes or stove boxes. Uh, you can tell when a congregation and was engaged with this curriculum because somewhere during coffee hour, somewhere uh, in the fellowship hall, you'd have this village pop up uh, of, these, of these refrigerator and stove boxes. And in my case, and this is when the curriculum is for the kindergarten and first and second graders, and I had this experience of building my home within the embrace of the congregation. There's a picture of me, a Polaroid someplace, of uh, the stove box and me kind of peering out from underneath it. Uh, and there's a big blue bat painted on the front of it to ward off my brothers, because brothers. And, and because this is a very bulky experience of creating this village, it was indeed in the fellowship hall, where everybody and all the adults would have their coffee after church every Sunday. And what I figured out in that moment was, here is me being able to create my space and my house and my sense of understanding, and here are the adults and the rest of the congregation seeing this and welcoming me. And that was a moment where I recognized how precious this congregation and this community was and that I had a place in it. That was a foundational experience of covenant, whether or not I had those words, because I could sense that commitment and that commitment not just to myself where I was, but where we could go together. And I still love going back to that fellowship hall uh, on the Sunday after Christmas and offering the sermon uh, over the holiday and remembering being in that fellowship hall as an eight-year-old and feeling that all over again. The experience of covenant is one that it can be a word that can be tossed around, not necessarily understood, but it's something that matters so much and makes such a difference if we take a little time and listen to it and hear each other's stories. Why be here? Why be part of this congregation? Why be part of Unitarian Universalism? There is so much potential and power and just paying attention to how our relationships are created and how we can build them together. Whether or not we agree, because we won't. Whether or not we get along, because we won't always do that either. It really matters that we are here and that we are here together in all the ways that we can be. It also matters that we find ways to recognize when we cause each other suffering and struggle, even, as, even when we've done our best to things, I think we've fulfilled our relationships. It's also growing up in Unitarian Universalism, uh, in, in some ways in that particular congregation, where I learned subconsciously a negative attitude towards Christianity. Now, I recognize that the adults did not mean to convey this, but they did, and I heard it and absorbed it to such a degree that when, one of, when I invited one of my friends to church and said, hey, we're really welcoming, uh, especially of other religious traditions, he said, you know what? No, you don't sound it. You don't sound like you're actually welcoming because this is how I've heard you talk about Christians and Catholics and so on. And I had to really pause and think about that and realize that even in the midst of deeply held and cherished beliefs, and even with dedicated, dedicated volunteers, and even with going to church every Sunday, that we still, there's still a lot of room to grow and a lot of ways to recognize how we have an impact on each other. And I had to also figure out how to forgive the congregation where I grew up, that I wasn't leaving anytime soon either. In that moment, I was able to recognize what was going on, and choose compassion, even though I was pretty unhappy about having to unlearn what I had been taught. That's also an exercise in covenant. 
is recognizing where the stumbling blocks are, where the fallibilities are, and having both that larger purpose that covenant points to, and also being able to say, this wasn't okay, and have that conversation too, and figure out forgiveness and ownership of mistakes and learning from that as well. Those are all exercises in the challenge of being a beloved community, wherever we're coming from. That larger embrace is so much a part of our, the congregation, of this congregation, of every congregation I've been a part. There is so much before us that we can keep encircling and keep making that circle, circle wider still. In taking that negative lesson from, that, from where I grew up, I recognize that that was a moment of kind of wounding of my experience of the intimate and the ultimate. But it's the heart of the practice as well, to name that and to figure out how to go forward. Promises are works in progress, just as we each are. They are beginning again every Sunday between members, between ministers, between our children and us. We get to recognize the full expanse of human experience, all the wonderfulness and all the fallibility, and create a living tradition that truly goes beyond any one particular circle. We know as much as we must accept and encourage and uh, care for one another, we get to be part of a much larger whole, that infinite sense of um, the immediate and the ultimate. And to be part of a much greater covenant. Because in being part of these Unitarian Universalist congregations, of the one I grew up in, I know that I'm part of a much larger commitment. I know that I am here to be saved from ignorance, to be saved from isolation, and to be saved from fear. I am here to play as large a part as I can and not shrink or reduce or give in to temptation to hide. I believe one of the best definitions of love is that I want to see the other rise to their potential. I want to see the promise of another person made manifest. That is motivation for a covenant as well, that we keep wanting this for each other as much as we want it for ourselves. Each of us will fail and fall and have to seek forgiveness again and again. Each of us will, have, will need to find a way to rail at the world and all of its injustices and still find ways to keep ourselves connected, centered, grounded in what is most important to us. With our covenant, we get to say, what is of worth? It gets to call us back to our chosen relationships. In the liberal tradition, it is to call each other each other to the free and responsible sir, effort for the common good, for the world community, for the beloved community that is at once around us and yet to be accomplished. Unitarian Universalism is a place of comfort, I'll tell you, but not of ease. This too is part of that covenant. Our Sunday promises are not about being safe and satisfied within a small circle. Our liberal promise is that we bring it out into the world. We can let our Sabbath be a time of rest and recovery, and yet there also must be moments when we leave dissatisfied, wanting more, and knowing that we can do something more together. As James Luther Adams reminds us, by their groups, you shall know them. We bring tradition, reason, and experience to the questions of our time, pass them through the fire of thought and spirit, and then show our response to the world, saying, this is what we're about. This is what we proclaim. 
Nothing less than the beloved community can or will ultimately satisfy those who are free and those who recognize that we are all in this together. This gets to be our ministry in action. The promise is not just about Sundays, of course. It is about every day, year after year. It's how about the covenant is in us when we leave our immediate gathering and go out into the world. It's about the answer to the questions that come any day of the week. Each Sunday, we get to practice our promises between one member and another, the minister and the members, between our children and us, between ourselves and the larger society at large, and put this into action. This promise is that we will so love the world, we will risk our lives to help it become more whole, this promise, knowing if it is well lived, that we are liberated and others are liberated with us. On any given Sunday, on any given day, let this promise be fulfilled in us. So may it be. Amen. Extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now, go in peace. Deeply regard each other, truly listen to each other. Speak what each of you must speak. Be ready in any moment to disarm your heart and always live as if a realm of love had begun, so be it.
and blessed be. Amen.